Um, Have you seen the ones about Gandalf uh, when he was going to fall down and fight the Balrog? How he sent off all of the Fellowship? And it, it wasn't to save them. It was to get them out of the way so that he could have all the XP for himself so that he could level up. <laughs> that's funny <clears throat> that's fun that's that, that's good that works <laughs> hey everybody welcome to another episode of the bearded bible brothers i am Firebeard matt crosswhite joined by snowbeard josiah marshall how are you snowbeard I'm doing quite well, Firebeard. Today we're discussing relationships and sometimes when they go go south. And I think we're going to touch on divorce in the biblical yes. context of divorce. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, when I suggested it for our next topic, the reason why is because it's just been so much in my life right now. My... I've got a brother that's going through, he's in the middle of a divorce right now. They're still doing things in court. And um, I had another relative that uh, nearly, uh, uh, their marriage nearly ended in divorce. Um, and one of the things I lived with growing up was that my, my, my extended family, every single one of my aunts and uncles divorced at least once wow at least once on my mother's side it was once um on my um my dad's side every one of his siblings divorced at least twice mm. so it and my what in my wife's family there was so much divorce in her family she she didn't even call refer to her family lineage as a family tree she called it the family bush because it was so fat oh my goodness <laughs> so wide in places wow. I was like, oh, okay um and uh you know it's it, and, and even just reflecting on that there was there was a, a situation a number of years ago where for my aunt for my wife's uh, uncle um one day her um his stepson went to college the next day, his wife walked out, out the door and didn't come back. And he later found out that she moved in with a man who had five kids. Wow. And she basically told him, nope, we're done. I'm moving on. I want to continue to be a mother. And I was only staying with you until my son was off to college. So he was wow. to say that made him feel very small. All right. Wow. What are some of the experiences you've had with um, divorce? Oh, quite a few. Mm. Uh, not in my personal family, not so many. But um, as a counselor, helping people through relational issues and um, yeah, and watching some of those relationships dissolve. And trying to help the the couple after they've made that decision, and um, help them as much as I'm able to to navigate those waters as equitably as possible, and co-parent if there's kids involved and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. It's very, it's just sad how much it is a part of our lives, and often I think too often we're we're left to feel that. Um, it's just uh, inevitable. Um, I was reading, I was reading a gentleman um, earlier, uh, uh, Dyer Dwyer. Um, he's a theologian that once was. He's long since passed away. But um, one of the things he was comparing marriage with was the uh, was the mandate to man and man and woman regarding the earth. And um, he said that man and woman are created to live and work freely in the world. It can become an environment which can be their playground. Though sin has often made it seem their prison. 
And I thought that interesting because it really can reflect that way sometimes in marriage when you feel like you're just stuck. But I think that partly has to do with the fact that there has been in in the past um, un, unrealistic expectations. So I think one of the first questions I think we could ask ourselves is, what is some realistic expectations one can have going into marriage? Mm. So what are some of your first thoughts about that? Uh, do you want the positives or the negatives? Oh. I was thinking more of the positives. Let's go into the positives of what, what are some realistic expectations sure. you can have for marriage? And then we can go into the negatives. <laughs> okay. Um, the positives would be um, uh, at varying levels over the, over the years, but you will have some level of companionship, someone doing life with you. Not, they won't always be peaceable and, and agree with everything you ever think or say or do, but you have right. somebody that's going through life with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because what one of the other things that I was reading about in, um, oh, what was his name? Rabbi. I'll, I'll remember it later. But <laughs> anyways, um, I've, I've referenced him before. He's, uh, he's the rabbi that's written that uh, the root connections in the Torah. And um, he was talking about the individual and the loneliness and what marriage transitions, transitions us from into what. And it's, it is that aspect of loneliness because even God's looking down on Adam and saying it's not good for man to be alone. It really isn't. But then he... He produces out of man, woman. And it really got me thinking there, wait a minute, if he's being produced, she, if she is being produced out of man, as a child would be produced out of a woman, there is then this aspect that she came out of me. So that's why he called her woman. But at the same time, that would at least right there, just on a natural order of things establish some expectation as to what the woman could expect from her spouse right from what the woman could expect from the man um and interestingly enough while we can put together some words to say just support and protect especially protect um exodus 21 9 through 11 i was going to pull that up here real quick Okay, so in Exodus 21, 9 through 11, um, it's, it's talking about the, 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 the laws about slaves, what God's heart is about concerning slaves. But what he says is this, um, 9 through 11. <laughs> All right, if he designates for her, if he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. So that's the ESV. But really right there in verse um, 10, you see that there is an expectation for food, an expectation for clothing, and an expectation for marital rights. Now, I, 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 I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but we can understand some basic ideas of what we think of marital rights, right? <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. Never ever. What would you say would bear bear evidence of being marital rights for, especially a wife, if she's going into a marriage? What would she deem to be marital rights? Oh, I would say um, it's. I, uh, hard to answer that without using like generic terms, non-measurable terms, but mm. um, yeah, I can understand that protection, compassion, um, mm -hmm. kind of more more from an ancient perspective, or or just a non-modern American perspective of um, passing from the protection of her father and her father's household to mm -hmm. husband and husband's household. Mm -hmm. Not as property, but as 
as uh, being looked out for, cared for, provided for. And mm-hmm. any feminists listening, please don't hear me say that women can't provide for themselves or take care of themselves. That's not what I'm saying. No, I'm saying you even is, you, you contexted that within the ancient. So we thank can, you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, certainly don't agree with all with most of what feminists believe, but I'm. I also don't want my words to be taken out of context. I'm not saying women can't do anything for themselves. Quite the contrary. Go read Proverbs 31. They are incredible. Uh, and Oh, boy. Right? I get tired reading all that the Proverbs 31 woman does. I, didn't, I don't even get up to do any of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, Lance. I mean, business owner. Household teacher, household keeper. Oh my word! Yep. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a list. I'll tell you. Oof. But I think those would be the the kind of base level expectations. What do you think? I think so too, and it and it can be especially based on this, um, on Exodus twenty one's context. It is that expectation to be carried, that expectation of support and protection. Because when we think of a parent-child relationship, there is this expectation that the parent gives to the child. Absolutely. And for the time, there is, for the, for the parent, you're carrying that child through life. Now, carrying can have certain connotations, of course. And sadly, I think in a lot of evangelical circles what would probably be deemed an automatic carry is what we think of out of these Ephesians 5 as that they're going to submit to their husbands and so yeah. I could almost picture somebody making the argument that I'm going to have to carry the burden of knowing my wife's either going to disagree with me even if she's not supposed to disagree with me and I'm just going to have to put up with it that could be one of my that could be one of the things I'd hear with that, right? But that could be one even, of the things that leads to divorce. Yes. Oh. <laughs> right, right, right. And even then that 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 reveals the psychology that marriage is here for me to take. Take, 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 right. take, take. But if we're to look at this natural design, not only from scripture, but even from ourselves, what is it? that a man wants to do for his wife. He wants to give her things. He wants to give her his heart. He Mm -hmm. wants to give her himself, bodily speaking. He wants to give her gifts. Um, Mm -hmm. The idea that chivalry is part of bringing feathers, I mean, feathers. (laughs) 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 No, I'm really going ancient here. Let's go tribal. Um, Right? No. Josiah, describe for me the last bouquet that you bought your wife. Oh, it was a bouquet of feathers. Oh, I got a bouquet myself of crow. That way I could eat the crow. But Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> Even crow. I was thinking at least like peacock or some pretty feathers. Not black, straight, boring. No, no. The, Poor Heather. The, 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 the bouquet of crow feathers was for me. I got her um, something along the line of pheasant. Oh, yeah, because that's a, a big colors. improvement. Well <laughs> done. And they say chivalry is dead. <laughs> uh, but, but you see what I'm getting at here. I, mean, I feel like there's giving... a, a really terrific, you might be a redneck joke in here. <laughs> if you buy your wife a pheasant feather bouquet, you might be a redneck. <laughs> oh, you were man. supposed to do this at the beginning, not the middle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll add some levity to the middle of this conversation. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Me. Oh me! Oh my! Oh moo! But no. <laughs> so yeah, we've got an idea of what it can be, especially culturally speaking. 
Boy, wouldn't that be quite a feather in your hat to have that kind of marriage? Oh, jeez. Okay, I don't want to fall into really, this really, not oh, silly. <laughs> but oh anyway. boy. <laughs> but anyways, okay, I, I can I can do this. I can do this. I feel like I'm having to be an actor real quick. Okay, and then slide the hand over the face, and the face is serious. Let's slide it back. <laughs> to myself. Yeah, that one was I all you. I did that. Okay, that was my fault. All right, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> moving on, moving on. Um, so okay, is that a divorce pun? Oh no, <laughs> marriage, divorce, and puns. That's what the title is going to be. <laughs> oh geez, marriage, divorce, and puns. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. So Sally, so, what happened between you and your husband? He just wouldn't stop punning. <laughs> Sally, you know they're called dad jokes for a reason, right? I know, but I just couldn't stand them anymore. Okay. Back on subject. You're not helping me. You're not helping me here. You're really not. You're not helping. Well, you know, they say laughter is the best medicine. So really, I am helping you. Just, I'm not helping you gather yourself for the podcast. I'm helping you get into good health. You're welcome. Oh, thank you. It means a lot that you're looking out for my well-being. Oh, yes, me. your cardiologist is going to be happy with me. <laughs> oh. oh, my word. Okay, so, where was I? Oh, yeah, Ephesians 5. So we got this potential uh idea of how a man could be seeing his marriage and you know it's interesting it just popped in my head that um so i like listening to old radio shows and old radio programs and i was listening to dragnet the other day and i like dragnet because um they actually pull from actual th events documented police events that took place in los angeles area and okay. um so these, uh, they just changed the names for the sake of those who are innocent. But um, one of the last stories I was listening to was this uh, a woman who was concerned that her mother had met foul end and mm. foul play and that her dad was at fault because she went to her dad and said, hey, I haven't seen mom in a while. Where is she? Oh, good grief. I see you smiling. <laughs> I said foul and you went bird. No. No, I didn't go there. I didn't go there. I went, uh, uh, gosh, I must be more tired than I thought I am. I, she met Foul End, like, oh, in a dark alley somewhere? Is, yeah. Is Mr. End okay? Where where did she meet Foul End? But I like I like the foul, foul part better. Oh yeah, we'll have to edit this. You'll have to edit this, this uh, episode quite a bit. Hey, it tells where we're at today. I think it's great. <laughs> this is a conversation, right? <laughs> yes. Not a linear one, but it is a conversation. This is true. Up and down, side to side. Right? <laughs> this is an example of my prayer life. Like, hey, God, what do you <laughs> want to talk about today? Hey, look, rabbit. Squirrel, shiny object. Oh, where were we? Oh. <sighs> Who are you again? Oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to say this. I'm, I'll get back to the story, but uh, <laughs> sure you, know you will. There's one, if, there, if there's one aspect of marriage that I see happening, especially in the Torah, it's joy. You get mm. married, you're not required to do military service for a year, right? Or go work there's in the that. fields, right? Yep. Right, but even then, there's even the other aspects of joy in life, and that is if you've built a um, uh, a house, you're also exempt from military service. If you've recently planted a vineyard, you're also exempt from military service for a year because God right. wants you to enjoy these things, right? Right. And you even look at um, Ecclesiastes, one of the most depressing books in the Bible for most pe for some people. But for me, it's it's one of those more rewarding ones because you get to see Absolutely. what meaning is. There's There's food. There's your partner. There's your work. And then when the conclusion, when all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments. 
So there it is in a nutshell. It's a sigh of relief. I don't have to spend my time spinning my wheels on all these other things. I get to just yes. focus on what's real. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And so back to the Stratnet story, because I think that one of the aspects of marriage that some couples fail to appreciate is a family with children. Children are going to see and hear everything. They are keen observers, as I've experienced them. Oy vey. Um, I remember my one time my my daughter even said something, and I said, where, "My thought is, wait a minute, where could she pick that up?" Oh, that was from me. Darn it! Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't anything yep. negative, really, but it was just one of those things going, "Ah, okay, whatever." But in the story, yep. this woman is having to tell the police about her very negative upbringing, how her dad would strike her mom. And and just terrorize them in the process, and how she explained to them, uh, we uh, we we really don't have any any reason to interact with him at all. And it was strange, kind of, because it was almost granted. While this story was written back in the early fifties, and the event probably took place in the forties, this is something very modern under with modern understanding that anybody could go, oh, I've been there. Sure. And they're seeing that done that, unfortunately. But she had to basically say to the police, I think my dad did it. When they went to the, the, the dad, turns out he's very much a narcissist, which she actually used in describing him to the police. And mm. um, he's he's coding everything with candy. He sounds like the nicest guy in the world. So now they've got two conflicting stories. But then when they finally start looking into evidence, start talking to the siblings, they find out, no, this marriage was bad. They were, he was yelling at her, screaming at her. And he said something interesting. So what he said was this. So here he is. He wants to come home. He wants to, he wants to uh, just sit back, relax, maybe, maybe read the newspaper, maybe take a nap. But here he is. He's calling his wife a shrew, S-H-R-E-W. And all he was, he's basically saying all she would do is just nag, 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 nag. And he would hit her. I wonder why you would hit her. I wonder why she felt like she was even afraid in her own home. But ultimately Absolutely. what happened was, is that, huh? Sorry, I missed it. I just, I just said, absolutely. I'm agreeing. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, ultimately the woman uh, finds out that her dad has actually rented out their family home and the police end up finding blood uh, down underneath the rafters of the master bedroom. Oh, I mean, uh, of the bedroom. So he and his wife didn't even share a bedroom. He he would tell her to go stay in her own room. And so uh, there was only one room in the house that was carpeted. And when they're down in the basement, the police noticed that there is blood dripping. And it's dried, but it, there's it's on the rafters below the, the floor. And so that's how they figured out, oh, he killed her. He killed her. Um, and... Sadly, this story, as I said, not only can it be appreciated in modern times, it's all too familiar for too many people in one aspect or another, right? Because not only would there be the expectation of what a spouse would expect in a marriage, what would the expectation of a child be in this case? Now, yeah, um, the child is even told, honor your parents. Now, how do you honor your parents? You honor them by the life they gave you. And here's here's what it's describing, that you're being provided food, clothing. You're being provided a, um, a, mar a, a relationship between a man and a woman who's going to elicit the idea that there is support, that there is protection, and then there is the aspect of carrying you when you need to be carried in life, right? There's this reliance of going, okay, if I something happens, I know my dad's got me. Right. So that would seem to be a realistic expectation. Absolutely. But sadly, it isn't. And what he's actually providing here in Exodus is um, the right for the wife to actually seek divorce when he fails to provide or even reduces in any quantity any of these three things. Hmm. Because. 
I don't want to immediately jump into divorce, but yet there's still this idea of of inequality or equality in marriage between sure between the the the, the sexes. <clears throat> and I, I would I would I, I'm one of the first to admit yes there is equal inequality. There are cultures in the world who subjugate women and make them out to be nothing more than chattel. I I, I definitely definitely I, I don't oppose that. Whatsoever. Absolutely. But what I am going to oppose is the idea that this is what we should expect. Mm. Because yeah. if anything, this is a moving into a, a new responsibility. So if for say the guy, I mean, we are guys here, so we'll definitely speak for ourselves. For me at least, <clears throat> when I was alone, you know, I had myself to take care of. But then when I got my wife, I'm going, okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of her. Now, of course, she was taking care of me, not to say she wasn't. But there is this aspect based on how we were created that if you look at it, we, we see this aspect that man is to give, a woman is to take. Now, if she's taking, what is she doing with it? Well, like any woman that receives something in a room, she's going to give back life. And out of what she is, what she receives, she's going to produce something good with it. So when a man makes a valiant effort to give and the wife just says, you know, what, that's not what I need from you. The man kind of feels let down. He, he, he feels like what he has to give isn't, isn't worth anything. And there's times where I've actually felt that with my wife and we've had to, talk about it and i'm saying and i'm telling her hey you know what what i'm what every effort i try to make to do something for you is coming from a very deep part of me it's this almost natural animalistic compulsion for me to try to do something for you right and there have been moments in our marriage where she's failed to appreciate that and that's that's fine we've been able to talk through that <clears throat> sure but what then can the man expect where is he going to go to be carried where is he going to be supported and protected well that's god that's yeah. god and really in this type of interplay we see a culmination of what it can really mean to be made in the image of god we've talked about that before and how even that image reflects something else of of what's above what's in heaven and we get to pattern that in a way that we may not fully understand at the beginning, but as we go through life, we can begin to appreciate we're receiving life from God. Just as we're giving to our wife, he's giving to us men. And he's not, that's not to say that he's not out supporting the women. He is supporting the women. God makes it very clear in the Torah. No, I'm looking out for my, 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 my females that I created, my human females, because in the ancient world at that time, women were considered like slaves. They were sold. There was even Babylonian stuff that you look into it. They were treated horribly, tossed away as if it, they were nothing more than a tissue. And yet here's God saying in the Torah, no, we're going to, no, no, no. There's actual rights that these women deserve. And not only for the non-slave, but even in the context of Exodus 21, for the slave. So if if there you know you go into a city you plunder it and then the men can uh take a woman to be his his spouse he's still obligated to help her move on if it doesn't work out now right absolutely i think now we we can start getting into divorce i think because what what i, I what, what famously said in fiddler on the roof is an actual Jewish precedent in commentary, Talmud, where the old Rebbe, he's sitting there at the table, and he says, um, if she burns his cooking, he is permitted to divorce her. And one of his guys said, just for burning supper. Yes, and they go into this, whoa, wow, what about, what is this? But yeah. it was a reality. Yeah. Right, you, he could let her go just for burning dinner. 
that would almost uh, there's your question that would what would what was the average expectation for a jewish man back in those days the woman could cook yeah so um the place we find ourselves in especially now i think becomes more saddened by the fact that in a lot of marriages there is unrealistic expectations but there's also a misunderstanding of the responsibilities we have now some people do and have used marriage casually almost cavalierly just going you know we'll use it for our own purposes that happens it continues to happen so what happens when a marriage starts failing what is the point so let me ask you this so in all your counseling what would you say could there be a definitive point where a marriage starts to fail or could it vary oh i think it can vary but um where marriage starts to fail um that's really hard because I've helped a number of couples come back together after infidelity and after uh, pornography and stuff like that. And then I've also seen plenty of couples part company over far, far lesser things. Um, so I'm not sure that I can specifically say that this is where things start to go haywire necessarily um good that was actually the answer i was hoping for because okay if you have this idea of going oh this happened okay i know where this marriage is going then the marriage is doomed at that point that's true yeah. so in my opinion it happens when you just finally give up mm. now if you're willing to take that responsibility back on there's hope but if you just give up that responsibility, yeah, it, it, it can be done, at least in your own mind. Right. For my for my, my wife's aunt, she was done with the marriage years before. And then when she walked out the door, that was the, the ultimate, okay, yeah, I'm leaving my responsibility behind. Ouch. So while we can look at Torah and see it as having protected the legal rights of a woman, what about the emotional rights? What about the the intellectual rights? Well, mm. when we look into New Testament, especially around the time that the way was beginning, what the, the followers of the disciple of Jesus called themselves was the members of the way. Women were actually involved in synagogue in talking about how things were going to plan out in these things. They were very right. much involved. Which is why Paul wasn't telling women to be quiet in synagogue because they shouldn't be they should be seen and not heard. It right. was because they were becoming so protective of their families that it was causing a disruption in the meetings. And it was preventing them from doing things in an orderly fashion and moving on. Because something may have been said accidentally or something must have been misunderstood or misheard. And it causes moms to just turn into that mama bear, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so Paul's whole expectation here was, no, 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 no. The husband and wife should be talking privately about what their principles are, what their goals mm -hmm. are. They, they'll already have their ketubah in place. Let that continue to be the standard for their relationship and let them continue to hone yeah. in on um, – the specifics and the practices and so forth of what they're going to do. And that way, when they go into these meetings, the man's the one putting himself as the target. He's the one making himself vulnerable. And by that way, he's actually protecting his wife. Right. Whoa. Where's a kooky thought? Right. <laughs> because. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't need to get into this completely, but uh, there was an expectation in these meetings that people come prepared. Mm -hmm. compared to to share and give and um the uh 
the what we see today is anything but. And if and if and if really if any if 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 our relationship with God is going to be any sort of metric for what a, a, a or even symbolize at all what a what a relationship between a husband and wife are going to be. What kind of relationship are you having with God if we're going into a building to become passive spectators? Right. And even that only for 45 minutes a week. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so um, in, in any relationship, there is obviously this expectation of giving and receiving. There is that expectation. So what happens when that falls apart? Where, what, where do we go now? Now, I, I read a book recently. Uh, it's called Christian and Divorced uh, by uh, Eaton Barr. And um, he is a, 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 a Messianic Jew. And he lives in Israel, if I'm not mistaken. And it's really a very short book. It's a quick, quick read. And I really appreciated it because it just really gave a snapshot of what Scripture is doing to provide the idea that there is something of a fluid, linear thought being presented and a non-conflicted one about divorce. So with that said, Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 says, the Lord Let's uh, you know. I'll even just pull it up. No matter what, um, no matter what what translation we pull into, it's going to be pretty standard. That when we look at this these verses, it says that uh, God hates divorce. Right? Have you heard that verse used? Oh, absolutely. And unfortunately, it's used as a club mm -hmm. too many times. Far um, too often. And have you heard of some of these churches? Now, I, not, not to get too sidetracked here, but I, I want to go ahead and bring this in here. Of some of these churches telling women, oh, it doesn't matter if you're abused or not. You need to stay in that marriage. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've counseled quite a few ladies who... Um, we, I had to work with them quite a while in order to get them to recognize that, that what you just said is not the case and is not biblical and that getting safe physically mm -hmm. and emotionally away from the situation, maybe not a full fledged divorce, but get somewhere safe because mm -hmm. you are in an abusive relationship and God does not want you to just take it. Um, building that into the into the woman um yeah. yeah yeah and and it really so if if we're going to read Malachi 2:16 and it says that um God hates divorce then what are we to deduce from that but oh then the marriage is indissoluble Right. It's absolute. If, it's if we take that line out of context of the rest of Scripture and everything else that God says about relationships and marriage and, yeah, everything like that, if we just, if we're looking for a verse to wield as a club, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the New Living Translation has the first statement being, for I hate divorce, says the Lord. Um, Berean standard for I hate divorce. Um, New American standard in the NSAB for I hate divorce. I hate. Div I mean, I can go through the litany of of of, uh, of translations here. Now, um, the ESV though says something interesting. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of Hosts. So guard yourselves in spirit and do not be faithless. Well, standing on its own, that seemed, you kind of go, wait a minute, what? What, what, what are we missing? Right. Um, what we're missing here is additional context. So if we go back to 
Um, 14. 14. You say, you want to read it? Um, sure. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll back up to 13. So okay. M- Malachi goes back and forth. God says, I have this against you. Yes. And y'all yes. will say, well, how do you have that against us? Right. And then he responds. So Correct. 13. Uh, and this you have done a second time. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, because he no longer regards the offering, nor receives it with pleasure from your hand. And you say, why? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have acted treacherously, though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. And Ooh. did he not... Yeah. Ooh. And did he not make Ooh. one? And he had the the remnant of the spirit, and what is uh, the one alone? He seeks uh, a seed of God. So you shall guard your spirit and let none act treacherously against the wife of his youth. For I hate mm-hmm. divorce, says uh, the Lord God of Israel. The one who covers his garment with cruelty, says the Lord of hosts. So you shall guard your spirit and not act treacherously. Right. Right. So we've we've got an idea here of something going on that we even say interplay uh, throughout the entire book of Hosea. God's mm-hmm. trying to address the relationship between him and Israel that started back at Sinai with their agreement. We're going to come into a marital relationship with you, a covenantal relationship with you. We've gotten into that before already. So the fact that he's right there saying covenant that marriage is a covenant it is a covenant of course and so but what happens when you treat it so blithely that you just consider it as nothing because that's what the israelites did they walked away from them almost immediately Ta-da! there's something that popped out of a pot over here and i don't know we just kind of sat down and started to to just you know appreciate it it's a work of art <laughs> that's almost how you expect aaron to say it right <laughs> well we just threw some gold in and out popped this calf Yep. Um, but yet recently I was talking with somebody and I was saying that Moses does something interesting with God. He almost steps into the role of an Ezer, which back in Genesis chapter two is describing the wife, describing the woman, mm-hmm. a help meet, a help mate. Ezer, uh, thank you. My dad's getting tongue-tied, Kinegdo. And um, this is a person who is standing face-to-face with you, who's offering support, Mm -hmm. who's offering their own insight and giving giving a relationship back. Because that's what Abraham, I mean, Moses is doing. He's actually, quote, reminding God of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And... Telling God, wait a minute, what would the other nations think that if you just bring your people, your children out of Israel, I mean, out of Egypt, just to kill them in the desert? You're just right. reinforcing what they think of you. But right there and then we see a demonstration of what a lot of Christians would say is a New Testament principle, and that's grace. Right mm-hmm. there and then God extends chesed, loving kindness, grace, and it's a beautiful sight. And he's continuing to do it. All the way to the point of Malachi where he's looking them face to face and saying, hey, this is what you're doing and that's not working for me. But he's trying to remind them of the wife of their youth. Yeah. Right? Now, we've already talked about how a lot of modern thinking looks at marriage as being indissoluble and absolute. What if, if we're going to take what God says at face value just here and what would he said, oh, that's all the Old Testament. There's nothing new going on here. This, the new hasn't happened yet. But hold on. What if that word for divorce right there that's being translated as divorce is perhaps something else? Mm. Um, the, the, the word there is salak. And it means to send, send away, let go, or stretch out. So wait a minute. If we're going to be specific here, he's not saying divorce. 
He's saying send away. Now, in order to divorce, that word is sefer keratut. That's a fun word, sefer keratut. <laughs> <laughs> I can almost picture a kid picking that up. <laughs> yeah, no way. But what that gets to is that there is the um, – it is the closest term to what we would understand in English as divorce because right. there is the bill of divorcement or the get, right. right? That was involved with a man saying, okay, here's your bill of, here's your bill of divorce. And that was actually a process. There was a three-step process involved. Here's your bill of, he, he would write up the, he'd get the get, he'd take it to his wife, give it to her with witnesses, usually in public. Which is why interest, which which helps us understand more of why Joseph was going to divorce Mary in private, because typically divorce was done publicly, and then he would send her away. Those were the three basic steps. There was no going to court. There was no haggling over who's this is this and who's this that. That was it. She was she was gone, but she was being provided for just the same. She wasn't just being left in a lurch. So. If this word here is saying God hates a woman to be sent away, then that's creating something else. There's two steps missing there. There's no get. He's not talking about the get, and he's not talking about presenting it to her with witnesses. He's talking about right. sending her away, right? He's talking about them transgressing yeah. what he what we what you already covered of taking care of them exactly. and treating them fairly. Yeah. Now there's that famous line, what man is, what, what God has put together, let no man pull us under. We, we, we understand that context. But when we look back at Genesis, the, the, the context being put together there, it's not necessarily the man and woman. It's actually the institution of marriage. Because even Paul and Peter go into the idea that in later times, people are going to tell you, don't get married. This, this institution is, is completely worthless. It's pointless. And I think it would be reasonable today to say to some degree, oh, yeah, there's evidence of that that could be presented as uh, to, to support this idea that, that marriage is just completely wasteless. It's completely useless. Wouldn't you agree? I agree that the argument can be made today. Yeah. 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 But. But. In this context, and I, I liked how um, so Bible Project actually did a video on um, part of the Sermon on the Mount, and mm -hmm. they're getting and they actually highlight the portion where Jesus is even talking. So let's so let's go ahead and go into this um, New Testament realm. So in Matthew chapter five is where we have Jesus talking on the Sermon of the Mount, and he's basically laying out his reading of the Torah and presenting it to his, his disciples, hopefully what would become his community. So Matthew chapter five, and it's in 31. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to read from the ESV. It says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay, so it, it seems pretty straightforward here. But at the same time, if we really dig into some of the grammar, something's not making mm. sense here, right? The first one says, the very first verse says, it talks about whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Okay, that's a standard process. Sure. Based on everything we've just said. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, wait a minute. Then that means if we divorce, we can never remarry. Right? Now, when Jesus is talking about – unless about, Go ahead. Unless it's a remarriage to the, the one who was divorced and neither of them had been with anyone else. Correct. That is allowed Correct. in Torah. but. But that any other remarriage. Yes, it's allowed in Torah. But what is also allowed in Torah is, is that if a woman if a woman is sent out and she gets married, the question then is, is she sinning? Is she breaking Torah? Mm. Is she breaking God's heart? Is she? 
is she doing this? Well, what's happening here is actually something that's still being an issue today. I was reading something about how even an Israeli newspaper referred to a woman as Aguna. An Aguna is a woman chained in marriage but sent away whose husband has taken another wife, but she cannot. Yeah, I saw the look on your face. So when we look at, say, so is that Second Samuel? David sends away 10 women to a house, and they live as widows. He's also doing the same thing. He's preventing them from being able to move on in their lives. Hmm. So it would almost seem contradictory to say that if a, a man does divorce his wife for burning the cooking and she goes and marries another guy. Well, hold on a second. Does that mean divorce can almost be just this casual thing? I would submit no. I would submit that this is a responsibility and an important one at that. Because not only we were reflecting the image of God, we're also reflecting our praise of God. This becomes an act of worship where we go and commit to each other, love one another, and even take dominion over the, over the planet. This is mm -hmm. something that he's calling us to do. And so it's not that he is treating marriage casually. It's that God is looking at it going, no, because of your hardened hearts. And he actually says this. I forgive me. I can't remember the address. But because of... Because of your hardened hearts, I am going to provide an avenue for divorce. Now, Jesus is saying, and as we understand, that it would be desirable for the woman to go back to the, to the husband of her youth, as even God's right. illustrating here. He wants Israel to come back to him and not continue right. on in their idolatry, right? He wants and he to, says so he, constantly through the prophets. Exactly, especially Hosea. Wow, what a... You read that, you just, wow, what, a, what an amazing picture of what God's demonstrating how humanity is thinking of and treating marriage and how God would look at relationships. Right. But, yes, it is between God and Israel, but that doesn't mean we can't grasp some basic principles out of this. Of course. Right? Marriage is incredibly important, and it is something that's instituted by God. So when we practice it, we are worshiping back. We are we are partnering with God and continuing to do the order of creation he established. Yeah. So it continues to be a reflection of not only a relationship with him, but what it means to be made in the image of God. So we are continuing to reflect that back. So I like the video, as I said. I even my kids even watched it. And at one point, I guess they got kind of lost in it and they go, Dad, why is why is it? Why does that woman like figure have a have a like looks like a silver chain on her leg? Why is mm. she why is she acting like paper? Why is she being draped over stuff? Well, because she's being treated like nothing. She's being discarded as if she is the get. She doesn't have it, so she's turning into the paper herself. It's almost as if her own soul. Now, this isn't what they're saying, but this is just me reflecting on it. Sure, sure. It's almost as if the woman's own soul is saying, I am becoming what I need. I need to get. I need to be able to move on to be, re to be able to receive and re be able to redo, redo, and renew what my purpose is, and that is to receive and give life. I'm not being given anything that I can use except loneliness, except abandonment. So, what happens then? Well, even in current days, women are still being left being without a get, and they're just being sent away. Mm -hmm. They are going into other marriages. They are getting married. So, if we read Jesus' words for what he's, what he's trying to say here, could it be that it would say it's, what he's saying is, but I say to you that everyone who sends his wife away causes her to commit adultery with somebody else by her marrying someone, someone else, whoever marries a sent away woman commits adultery. Because she's still Just married the, to somebody else. She was never, she was sent away, but she was never given the certificate of divorce. Exactly. Exactly. And, and even in this verse, we go into our handy dandy interlinear here. 
And, and while you're uh, pulling that up, that also, uh, and when it says, except for the matter of sexual immorality, in which case, if, if the goal is to try and restore the relationship, but you send her away for a period of time so that she's not allowed to be with anybody else, but you guys work on the relationship between the two of you, you don't want to divorce her with a certificate and be done with her, but you don't want, you can't share the same bed, let's say, um, because of the sexual immorality. You need a period of separation, and that's acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. So there is definitely some more things to be to jumping in here and, and to not be treating casually. I don't want to be doing that at all. But um, there are things going on here that should, for any average person, cause their eyes to go wide and they ask the question, wait, what? If the word there is apoyo, which is the Greek equivalent of sent away that Jesus is using, why is the word divorce there? Now, I've said it before, and I'll go ahead and re say it again. Sadly, there are agendas with translating. We see it all the way back to King, yeah. uh, King James. He made it very clear, hey, you're going to translate that word. You're going to translate it the way I want it to be said. I don't want to give my subjects any ideas here about what they think they're capable of doing to their king. Mm -hmm. And sadly, that's still going on today. I, I repeated a story where um, a, a professor in, in, in Israel was interacting with a guy that was on the NIV translation committee. And the NIV guy said to the professor, no, if people read the Bible for what it's actually saying, not only would the church be emptied, but they would get ideas of their own. There is an agenda here. Church is an institution that sadly locked people in. The reality that just even a couple, just even uh, recently, I knew I heard of a woman whose husband was beating her, mm -hmm. committing adultery, and beating his kids. And she goes to the elders of her church and says, "I need help here." They tell her, "You need to go home and pray." Jeez. You need to find out what you're doing to cause your husband to act this way. Hold the phone. Hmm. Hold the ever freaking phone. Come on. Give, give me a break here. Come on. Somebody with any measure of sense is going to look in that and call foul. Yeah. And foul end. Because I'm sure for a foul end, there'd be some guys who'd want to meet that husband in the back end of an alley. Mm hmm and express themselves to him in certain ways that he's not going to be walking well with. <laughs> right. First of whom would be her father and brothers. Oh, yes. Yes. So, I think what we've got going on here is a renewed responsibility to not only look at the word and study the word and actually understand what's trying to say, but that we've got an element going on here that is so long, even in the Christian church, no matter how well intended, has subjugated women to the point where I think it, Mark Driscoll, I think, is a prime example, if not the culminary example, of modern thinking today of what a woman is expected to be in the Christian church. And how the current translation supports that agenda. Because if we're looking at it here, Jesus is making something very, very clear. Now, I was just looking at um, something I wanted to read that was the um, basically what, 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 what would it look like to actually see the, uh, the Matthew 5 translated in a way. So it hath been said, whosoever shall be put away, who shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Okay. Apostation. That's the word for divorcement. But I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife, Apollo, his wife, except for the cause of fornication, an illegitimate, unrecognized, forbidden union, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever shall marry her that is 
put away commits adultery. Now, Jesus is talking about something very specific going on in his time. And it's still going on today in the matter of Israel. Right. But I, 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 I think for, for the purposes of this conversation, I would really like to support any and all listeners that if you are going through divorce, don't think that you are sinning against God and becoming a heretic. Right. If you are in a, in a relationship that is abusive, I don't care if you're the woman or the man. Men are just as abused as women are sometimes. And sadly, there's a great shame on men to keep their mouth shut because they should be able to protect themselves against a woman who's hitting them over the head with a frying pan. No, God gives just reason, just reason, justest reason for a divorce to be dissolved. And there's a specific way to do that, especially in ancient Israel, but there's even right. a way to do that even today. Get the divorce and move on. If that relationship can be restored. I actually knew of a, of a, a relationship here in Utah um, of a Mormon couple, actually, um, who he stepped out. He went to his wife and apologized. And he says, I really want to make this work again. And I'm very sorry for what I did. They separated. They came back together and they're still in, in the marriage now. That's awesome. Wow. That's a beautiful picture of what this can be. If we're willing to take mm -hmm. responsibility for our actions and take up back up again that mantle, this yoke, this, this responsibility of being in a relationship with someone else and what the expectations should and can be, something amazing can happen here. Because I think that the future of marriage is much like what we want to see even with the return of Christ. We want to see something beautiful being made. We want to see a creation being done that's going to reflect that relationship in a way that's not going to be just on the land, because a lot of covenant marriage, there was a lot of land and marriage aspects going on in scripture. So that, yeah, the land, my wife and I live on an acre and a half of land. Yeah, we, we have plans to put it in an orchard. We're going to be putting things in so that later on down the road, we look at this and we see a life built. But more than that, we see creation being done in a way that reflects what a healthy relationship can look like, not just between a man and woman, but also between man and God, humankind Absolutely. and God, right? And second, I mean, first Corinthians chapter seven, Paul is talking about marriage. I think it's key to remember there that there are actually points where even Paul is saying, hey, now this is my opinion. This isn't something God has said. This is my opinion. He says, in my opinion, it's actually better that if a man not get married or a woman get married even, but for a very specific purpose. If you're going to be dedicating your life to God, then stay single. Because when he, and his, his logic is you get married you're going to be distracted a lot. You're going to have the responsibilities that you're going to that, that are going to be a cause be a distraction from your relationship with God at times because you're going to have to take care of worldly matters. Not to say that it's sinful, it's just that you're going to have to take care of uh, rashes on a baby's butt. <laughs> you're going to have to take care of the kids when the wife is sick and vice versa for crying out loud. Come on man, don't think you're you're out of this on Anyways, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Suffice yeah. it to say, there are reasons to stay single. There are reasons for divorce. And there's even greater reasons for marriage. And if we are going to be followers and disciples of Jesus, I think it is incumbent upon us to take on that high responsibility that discipleship is calling us into. And actually try to understand what God is saying rather than just simply casually taking what we think he understands and then go from there. Yeah. He's not trying to make things difficult by, by speaking in Hebrew. And then now we have to read it through <laughs> English and apparently through selected English. No, whatever man's agenda is, God's agenda is still the same. Yeah. He wants Israel to come back to him. 
And right now, he is. this is the time for the Gentiles to come to God and to continue to support Israel and saying, no, let's return back to a relationship with God. And it's happening. Praise God it's happening. Yeah. So I think that concludes my my thoughts on this. What are you, you have anything Good else? Good stuff. No, I think I think you covered quite a bit and I it's fun when I get to learn from you and and get to hear the, some of the things that you've done uh in research and no, this has been good. I I really appreciate let me talk about this because it, as I said, it is something that's continuing to be a problem for my extended family. And uh and a problem for my wife's extended family. We're still living with these problems every day. And while it's being discussed, and while there are sources out there that are discussing it in very biblical ways, I think still the simple language can be said that divorce can be fun. It can be, a, excuse me, marriage can be fun. It can I be. I was wondering like, about that one. Okay. That's, sorry, right. that was a misstep of the tongue. Completely. Hello, left field. Sorry, did not mean that. Marriage can be a playground. It of course. It can be a place of fun. As a matter of fact, right now, what was that? Proverbs 8, I believe it is, where it's talking about God and his creation and how the Son of God is, they're, they're, they're playing and enjoying his creation together. Mm. Ooh, what a beautiful picture that creates. Go read it. Go read it, folks. Go read Proverbs 8. Think about it in context of what we've been talking about here. Because marriage should be fun. Yes, there's going to be hard times. Yes, there's going to be harder times. But when you get to the end of life, as many people are today, and they've run after careers, they've run after other goals, and they find themselves in their late years, and they're sitting there realizing, wow, I'm missing one thing I really would like to have right now. Yeah. And that is family. That is progeny. Which when we look at Abraham, when it's when it the when the verse says he had everything, well, when you try to make up a list of that, good grief, you're not yeah. gonna get covered. But when you look at that ver word that's being used there in the context, Abraham got everything because he got the one thing he wanted. He mm -hmm. got a kid. And he got the promised kid. Yeah. Wives, if you're in a situation right now where you are in danger, there are ways to getting out. Um, aren't, aren't there, Matt? There, there's there's just domestic Absolutely. abuse lines. Um, there's women refuge. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, not refuge. Well, it is a refuge, but basically it's safe houses, right? Yep. Yep. There are lots yep. of resources all around. Too many for us to list and and. Some of them are, are region specific, but, and we have international listeners, but yes, uh, in short, if husbands or wives are in an abusive situation, reach out for help, ask right. somebody, talk to a neighbor, um, get, get out of that. That is not, that is not what God wants. That is not no. biblical. No. And yeah. And if, and if you're not getting the help you need, keep looking. Abuse, the average abuse, isn't always visible. Mm -hmm. There is what's known as a, a invisible abuse. Abuse, whether we think it is or not, still damages us in ways we can't appreciate until much later. So, with that said, because I know, well, that would be a conversation to go into just on abuse itself. Oh, my word. But yeah. um, thank you, Matt, for, for kind of letting me just uh kind of dump here so to speak um and take long-winded conversation on my end at least but um I, I this is just a place i've been in and i'm glad i was able to share it with you and hopefully to someone else who, who needed to hear it absolutely absolutely and to our listeners we appreciate that you that you joined us on this conversation um if you have thoughts comments questions concerns um, other topics that you'd like for us to cover in the future, please, please write to us. 
beardedbiblebrothers at gmail.com. And until the next episode, keep, keep staying in your Bibles and keep praying. And we'll talk to you next time.